Brennan, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. Nice to, nice to meet you. How are it you? It is good. It's fantastic. I good. love. We've been here a few minutes. Just get quickly getting set up. We're yeah. Like, I love the space because this is designed it's for, for one person it's to work. For, yeah, it's a one person place. So this was a two car garage, and um, and I wanted I wanted a place where you know, where I could work with keyboards and guitars and vocals and no drums uh, because I wouldn't, because I also have to live here, sure. you know, and I don't want people, and I don't want to, and I don't, I'm not, I'm not interested in renting this out. This is spe specifically sure. for me and mostly for guitars, but, and then editing or whatever it is or voiceover occasionally. Um, but I wanted a room where I could turn amps up loud, you know, tuba amps up and mic them and, sure. and that's what, and that's why we have this tiny little room. It's, uh, I keep on shooting in, even though it's very small. Yeah. But it's not tiny if it's just you working. It's true. It's, it's kind of perfect. If it's me and a dog, it's fine. You and a yeah. dog is perfect. Yeah. It's also kind of a little bit of a guitar player's paradise because you've got, I don't know, it looks like about 20 or 30 <laughs> guitars crammed. Crammed. I have them all crammed here. I have this huge Christmas tree stand right here that's, um, this is, this is, uh, all these guitars were in tune and they all had fresh strings, um, this time last year because I was finishing the guitars for Galacticon 2. Yep. And so I wanted to bring some of my favorite guitars out and uh, have eyes on them so I could just grab them and switch them and, and you know, in a, in a moment's notice, swap out guitars and have Fantastic. them all here. So I've got a few others, but but they're, they're in storage. Did yeah. you grow up coveting the Explorer? Because I think I associate that with you. Um, I, you know, I just think uh, it's one of the coolest ro looking rock guitars of all time from... Is, yeah. From the 70s to now um, I just like looking at it so and it's got a really nice balance and a really good sound and a classic Explorer is, is hard to beat it's hard to I'll put it up against a Les Paul you know yeah yeah and I see a flying V over there yes yes the flying V oh two there are a few well that's the snow falcon and those are the Gibson ones and I have an epiphone version of that mm -hmm. out as well and uh, well when I started making the animated show the Metalocalypse I wanted to put real guitars in there. That was one of my first ideas. Was that first of all, this is a show. This is a show that I'm trying to sell. A show that's my job, you know. So I'm yeah. trying to make sure it's it works. That the story is told. It connects with an audience and all that stuff. But I also thought that this is a show for me when I was 14 years old, discovering the guitar. So I thought it would be cool if we had real guitars. You know, not like I'm not going to reinvent the guitars because every shape has been. I don't want to make a new shape or a new thing. Sure. Not for the show. I want to have recognizable Gibsons on the show. And I, I talked to Gibson very early on, and I said, "What if we animated your guitars on the show?" And they said, "That's really cool." And I said, "This is a, you know, an extreme metal band, and I'd like the pointiest guitars, and I'd like to have Explorers and Flying Vs on the show. And then there are lots of other things. You'll see a Kramer occasionally." You'll see Les Pauls, ES three thirty fives. You'll see a bunch of stuff from the Gibson. Familiar stuff, yeah. yeah. So, um, so that was a, a fun partnership that they were excited about being a part of, and they also gave us the AutoCAD files. You know, the the blueprint, the digital blueprint of the of right. the actual guitars, because some of these guitars are asymmetrical and hard to draw. I don't know if this is in the shot. Is this in the shot? We can we definitely grab make it, it yeah. be in. So this is a prototype for. A guitar that I don't know if it will ever get released, but it's. Um, I asked them to make it for me, and this is the Gibson Snow Horse. Nice. So I like to name guitars too, because I don't know. <laughs> so there was the, that's the white one is the Snow Falcon, and then I have a. Can you pass me this one right here? Absolutely. This is the Thunder Horse, which is the first guitar I put out with Gibson. So it's a silver burst with. Um, Beautiful. Yeah, and I don't even know what pickups these are. I must have swapped them out. These could be Demarzios at this point. I'm not sure. But, um, you know, I wanted a cool guitar with binding and silver burst and, you know, but ultimately classic medium output pickups. And um, and same with this. These are, oh, these are Seymour Duncan. I think these may be the Pearly Gates. These are like Billy Gibbons. Nice. Uh, things. And you can see the last time I used it, um, it's got tape. Sometimes you'll see tape on these videos with me and guitar and guitars. There's tape there. There's tape there. And that's an Ulrich Wild trick. Who's right. the you know co-producer and engineer mixer of of all my work, and um, I'll put that back and over there. And our mutual friend, and uh, and a good yeah, and our mutual friend, yep. and uh, a very reliable guy with a great ear, and, and very um, Swiss, very Swiss. Very he's Swiss. precision based, which precision is very based, yeah. Yes. So he's very much on time. Mm -hmm. He does not mess around. He gets the work done, but he's also we log 
and this I work in a business where I will, I will log lots of hours with like one person. Yeah. So in post production and animation and post production and music videos, I'm sitting with a compositor for months. Yep. And f mixing a record, I'm sitting with Ulrich for a long time. So you got to get along with him and have a sense of humor. And he's got uh, a very funny, very dry. Sense it's of very humor. dry. Yeah, we'll like go long hours, Chinese water torturing each other with humor, <laughs> and uh, and then and then dialing in the sound that we want to hear. You know, it's fantastic. Yeah, it's really fun. So you have a Strat, though, you know? We'll, we'll, I we... do have a Strat, I know. I yeah. reserve the right to play all guitars. I know, but it's, yeah. uh, it looks like it's out to be used. So is this uh, something this you've is, been using uh, recently? I think um, there. I had a nice uh, just afternoon guitar jam session on a free day with Nick Johnston, who is a Canadian guitar player. And he's, uh, he's a young guy who's just a really great player and a mm -hmm. nice guy and makes his own records and tours. And um, he came over and we pulled this out. And we we're just comparing necks of different guitars. This is a, a 54 reissue I got from the custom shop. And it shows up here and there on a few songs. Um, and I think I swapped out the pickups for Seymour Duncan's. And this thing just, it's, it's got that road worn thing, you know, sure. where they kind of knock it up and scratch it and mm -hmm. stuff. And, I first was not a fan of people trying to make guitars old, but what they do in these relic guitars that is really important is they remove a lot of the paint on the sure. guitar. And your guitar can breathe and dry out, and mm -hmm. and it does something for the tone when there's not as much paint. So when I am even asking for prototypes and Gibsons, I'm saying, give me one layer of paint. Don't give me too much. Even on the older ones, I've gone from having a high gloss finish to having an unfinished, nearly unfinished one one coat of paint kind of a thing, just because one of the luthiers at, at Gibson told me, I pointed to one of my prototypes, and I go, why do, why do, why do I like this guitar better than mm -hmm. everything else? And he goes, easy, less paint. Ah. It's a little thing. So when you're just playing like, you know, not death metal or anything terribly scary, and you just want to play and, you know, plug into a, you know, a Marshall, like a Plexi or a Fender or this Bogner over here. I was admiring that Bogner when yeah. I first arrived. It it makes it sort of reminds me of a classic '60s Marshall combo. Yeah, well, it, it, looks, it looks like that, that way. way. It looks that way. I'll give you this to put down. But um, you know, just like guitars, everyone's trying to find the perfect combination between a Gibson and a Fender, somewhere between single coils and humbuckers. And in <clears> amps, <throat> I think everyone's looking for the perfect combination between a Marshall and a Fender, which is like the high bright, compressed cleans that mm -hmm. can break up just a little bit to the gainy side. So. I've got a I've got a thing that I'm going to post to you. Uh, mm -hmm. I work with a lot of Gibson guitar players, mm -hmm. and nobody appreciates. I'm going to say this to camera: a yeah. Strat more than a Gibson owner. <laughs> I know, because it's every true. Strat owner puts a Wonder Bar or a Floyd Rose or humbuckers on mm -hmm. it, mm -hmm. and then Gibson owners buy Strats and keep them as Strats because they want a completely different sound. Yeah, you want look. You want to. I'm in a studio. I want variety mm -hmm. uh-huh yeah so i have i have lots of different guitars here i think there's no such thing as a bad guitar sure um and i have ibanez's over there that i sure. love that's an actual satriani ibanez that i was he, wondering that when i saw that from the corner of my that eye that is yeah. a that was a gift from nice. from from joe, the satch from toured around the world and from joe yeah i say and, the satch because i just did a video recently and somebody said oh satch said whatever and i was like who's satch and they're like <laughs> <laughs> they were like, you didn't know. You didn't know that was. Yeah, yeah exactly. I can't believe you don't know that. But <laughs> exactly. um, but yeah. So I will have lots of different guitars around here. I have electric twelve strings and stuff like that. And sometimes I'll just pull them out for like mm. one little moment, or I want a whammy bar that's like a classic Floyd Rose kind of a sound or something. I'll pull something out. So speaking of which, what's that down there? Oh, this guitar. <laughs> this is insane. I saw this guitar the first time and I thought, I don't know what you're trying to sell me on. <laughs> And I picked it up and I'm like, this is lightweight and I don't get it. And then I played one and I plugged it in and my whole mind changed about this guitar. This is a um, Strandberg. I've never heard of it. Strandberg. So this is uh, from Norway, I believe, or Sweden. Oh, geez. Anyway, you guys can We'll have a link the, somewhere yes. down here. Yes. Someone will yell and tell me what it is. I don't care. Yeah. Um, but it, this is a, uh, these are Sur pickups, S-U-H-R. Oh, right. This is a multi-scale guitar too. So it's got um, a longer low E. If you look at it, yeah. the E string here is longer than the high E. And it's got fan frets. And I thought this makes no sense. And then 
on the back, it's got a squared off I know, I like, plane for your thumb to go, and it travels asymmetrically down the neck as well. Right. It comes without a back plate on the, the trem system, and this cool kind of just cover, this metal yeah. cover. And it's the sound is completely dialed in. If you play a G chord on something like this, you can feel the whole guitar vibrate almost like you're playing with a Sustaniac. Wow. It just it just makes a lot of sense. And uh, I wish they made them a little bit bigger so I don't feel fat when I play them. You know what I mean? <laughs> it's time. Do you mind if I hold it? Because I've it, never. Yeah, please. Oh, you are not joking when you say it's light. Yeah, and then it's got this little comfort curve right there where you can play it, you know, oh. like that or like that. Oh. And eventually your hands will learn because I think as you go up the neck, there's something ergonomic because your hand, when you start out, starts fanning that way with the fan frets. And I can access notes on that guitar that I normally can't access on a regular straight fret guitar. That's crazy. It may not be perfectly set up. I did change, no, no, I braved just... the, the string changing uh, on this and you just um, just get an Allen wrench and you un undo this and then you undo that and you put regular guitar strings in. You don't have to have double balled strings or anything. You can just get them from any place. And this trem is really great and it's just got a lot of, it's these pickups are perfectly matched to this and I think this is an ebony fretboard and a maple top and there's little recessed I mean, you know, chambers in there. There's something to be said for this guitar and if when you play one you'll know what I'm talking about. But uh, I don't work for those guys. What am I doing trying to sell that guitar? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Anyway, I love guitars. And that's... <laughs> well, that one was, do, don't you have a signature Gibson already? Yeah. I, uh, so that one, that's... That one one's I, a signature. So the, the second one we And this one probably hasn't Ooh, been restrung in years. That's and I just right. dented it. I know. Um. It's okay. These are all built to be dented. If you're not denting your guitar, I don't know what you're doing. Um, so yeah, there's, there's nothing... I wanted classic on yeah. this. I wanted this to be a guitar that could have existed in 1970. Um, or now, and um, and it's a classic Gibson in wood, and this is this is a uh, I believe a rosewood neck on this one, and uh, and it's got a nice wood grain. The only thing I would do now is put less paint on this part and right. let the wood breathe a little bit more. But um, these usually come with burst buckers, mm -hmm. just classic burst buckers, which is like a medium output, has a nice kind of bite to it. And uh, and it has a real tone to it as well. So that's this is the Thunder Horse. If you can get one of these, grab it because they don't. We're, we're not. We only made a limited amount, so they're probably raising in value. And I know that the uh, Flying V Snow Falcons have raised in value as well. Beautiful. Yeah, but uh, so I've got to ask you, a Galactico. Now, yes. You can tell I'm English, which yes. means I grew up as Queen is my favorite band. Uh, yes, I can see where you're going with yeah. this already. So so, but was what is it? So the question is, is it just because, I mean, your stuff is incredibly musical. It's right. very musical. When you take rock and take it very melodic and very musical, mm -hmm. it's always going to, I mean, Muse do it. They end up sounding like Queen quite often. They do, but they was also... It, was yeah. it deliberate for you? Or? Yeah, I mean, there are moments where I'm, I'm thinking, well, nobody's doing this multiple stack guitar harmony that's very voice-led mm -hmm. in, in like a traditional harmonic way, in, in that Baroque style. And Muse does use that Baroque style as well, mm -hmm. where they are using 151, 151, and they're using classical changes too. Sure. And, and Brian May and Freddie Mercury and the whole mm -hmm. group was very skilled in using classical music and being able to kick on the distortion pedal and sure. make it rock very hard. And um, yeah, I think uh, my whole life changed when I heard the Prophet song mm -hmm. off of... Um, not at the opera. Not at the opera. And uh, Golden, I'm a Queen fan. I know, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but I remember that was the um, first time I think I was 11. My track one, side two. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> my parents had the record for some reason. And I remember for the first time going, okay, I need to know who wrote this. And it said May. And I was like, May. Then I saw Mercury and I saw Deacon and mm -hmm. I saw all these. And, um, and I wanted to know who wrote what and why they wrote what. And there was just enough information to keep me, my exactly. brain excited. Mm -hmm. Not too much information. And I saw, look, I saw, I think we're always trying to ch like, you know, travel back into the womb in some way. It's the first movies you see. It's the first records you listen to. I saw Flash Gordon the movie in the theater. Too and nice. I thought, there's no way this movie's going to be able to beat this intro with the comic books flying around yep. and these stabbing cool guitars and it's Freddie Mercury and mm -hmm. all these vocals and everything and just the energy and the mm -hmm. excitement 
Flash Gordon cannot live up to this song. There's no possible way mm -hmm. that the human could live up to the majesty of the song. So, yeah. so in filming and making, like uh, if you look at the Galacticon short that I just put out, if you haven't seen it yet, check it out. There will be a link. Yeah, check out the link. But this is uh, this is me being inspired by Mike Hodges, who directed or any of the Dino De Laurentiis productions, Dune, sure. um, you know, all, all that stuff from Toby Hooper movies to the from in the early '80s, Life Force. Uh, so there's a whole visual thing that I'm trying to do that is, you know, I'm inspired by the stuff I grew up on, and yeah. you know. That's usually how it works. Yeah. You know, you just keep it in the back of your brain. You're chasing it down, trying to do stuff with that. So, so yeah. So I stack guitars. Uh, I'm making heavy music, and I'm trying to have the vocals be melodic as well. And I'm stacking those like crazy. So I'm usually losing my mind in this room, stacking one thing or another: keyboards, mm -hmm. guitars, getting different sounds, getting different amps. I have a stack of amps back here as well that I that I use. But um, but yeah, Queen is a big part. So. Yes, guilty as charged. I'm sure that at some point they'll serve me papers. It's it's okay. <laughs> uh, I, I, in all of the music, uh, especially on the album, which I know very well because of you know Auric and I yeah. doing the course on one of those songs. Oh yeah, yeah. okay, yeah, that's right. Which song yeah. did you do? It was Triton, wasn't it? Triton, the first song. Okay, yeah, first song. yeah. which is yeah, it's standard tune rock song basically. Yeah. I mean, I hear the influence, but I don't hear it. It's not like you. It's there. I mean, yeah, it's yeah. there. I mean, hopefully, what you do is you get influenced, even in, in film comedy or whatever, and then mm. hopefully you cover your tracks a little bit. But sure. if somebody says, I hear Queen, I go, that's a compliment because oh, yeah. I'm trying to rip them off in some way. Um, but I'm also trying to, there is Weezer inside of that record. Sure. There is Soundgarden inside of that record. Sure. There is modern black metal kind of stuff, you know, kind of like tremolo picking moments inside of records, uh, songs inside of that. Um, then there's like AC, in my mind, there's ACDC. And then sure. I have like slow rock tunes where I'm trying to get medium tempo stuff so I can chase down moments of the Prophet song every once in a while. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah. For me, it was Bohemian Rhapsody because I was yeah. a little kid and it was the number one single mm -hmm. in England. And my dad was a classical and uh, jazz buff. And okay. He bought, he bought me that record for Christmas and said, this is, this is okay. This, this, is, this can fit in the world that we live in. And it was the first rock music I ever heard. I really? Eight, I was eight years old. I put it on wow. and I was just like, what is this? I know. I knew, I knew about that stuff before it had gotten popular in its second run with mm -hmm. Wayne's World out. Yeah. You remember? Yeah, I do. But I was like, I know this song already. I've been listening to this. Nobody showed me this or anything. I knew that I knew some of the radio hits. You're my best friend, and uh, but 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 there's so many. I mean, that record is the ultimate record. If you're a musician, imagine that you get to do um, "Death on Two Legs," which is just such a powerful, <laughs> angry. There's anger. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's about them ex-manager. Of course, yeah. yeah. Yeah, thirty nine. Yeah, thirty nine. Good company Good with company. all yeah, the horn to, section, clarinets. The whole yeah, all done like on uh, guitar. he does like a slide trombone on his yeah. guitar. All that stuff is so inspiring, and the fact that he had uh, you know, what John Deacon, right? Yeah, the DC amp. Uh, I'm about to say, yeah, the DC amp, which yeah. I have one of those. Whoa, whoa you do? I've I never have, seen one in the flesh. I have a Vox one. Some it's somewhere in here, and I've used it on records. In fact, I used it on the first Galacticon. Oh. I, I, and it has that sound. It sounds exactly like that kind of spongy, squashed, small. Amp. Transistor radio. Exactly, amp. yeah. So, of course, I'm a fan. And I do have a Brian May guitar upstairs. Ah. So, don't think I don't. I have all that stuff. And I have a Vox AC30 in the other room, too. So, right. so I'm a fan. Oh. And he's a, like, when you see him interviewed, he's like the most humblest, has no ego, super smart. Oh, yeah. Yeah. But what is significant about this is that this is Brian May's favored form of plectrum. And um, thank you for calling. Yes. <laughs> um, and I believe this these were given to me um, by a friend of Rick Musolem's, who's a great guitar player who lives in Los Angeles. And I believe uh, they are period correct. <laughs> yep. Well, they 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 sure. only made them. They were already out of a circulation by the time. 1966. Oh, wow. Yeah. When did he build his guitar? It was like 63, 64, wasn't it? Uh, well, you tell me. Jeez. I, I think know. so, yeah. yeah. I, have, I also have a Brian May guitar book upstairs. So I'm a fan. Obviously, Good. I'm a fan. Um, so you were right to say that. But yeah, I used that sixpence on the new Galacticon record for a couple moments where I was just scratching the strings, just getting little... Those, yeah. 
I mean, to get his sound that kind of upstroke, you get a little bit of that harmonic in there yeah. too. So, I I'm mean, I, I have some, and I've never been able to use them. Really, it's just it doesn't whole... sound the same. I mean, you listen yeah. to them, like, keep bright, yourself mate. alive. Yeah, you, yeah. You have to like really, and he plays very light gauge strings, yeah. and I'll usually play way heavier gauge strings. So that will, ch all that stuff changes. Mm -hmm. You know, it changes the sound. So I haven't tried it on his guitar with his strings and. Um, and I'm uh, frankly, I'm used to my own pick. I'm not going to learn another pick, but I yeah. will use that for a little couple moments, just a couple little bells and whistles. Well, and plus, I mean, you know, you you shred as well. You do, you I do. Play, his... I play fast guitar occasionally. Yeah. Yes, yeah. which is probably, I would imagine, quite hard to do. With That's this. hard to do with that, unless you're like picking a note and doing all these kind of like you know hybrid picking things where you're right. using your fingers and. Yeah, if you're using more legato, probably yeah. possible, but. But. Uh, yeah, but I think it, uh, that's an important part of guitar playing is, and I think it's part of every kind of art where you have heroes. Um, I had, you know, not not just Brian May, but Steve Morris, Ingve Malmsteen, John Petrucci, uh, Alan Holsworth. Oh, a lot of huge Holsworth. Uh, yeah, um, Angus Young, uh, yeah. you know, all the guys that Jeff Beck, all Jeff the people Beck, that yeah. did stuff on guitar, you yeah. tend to gravitate towards. And it's a really fun thing to do now and when you start out is just try to do an impression of your your favorite guitar player. Can you mock their, can you ape their vibrato? Can you um, mock their pick attack? Can you can you copy them in some way? So sure. trying to do a, you know, trying to just sound like Hendrix bending a string is a really good exercise. Trying to do, so I think like comedians do the same thing. They think about their favorite comedian when they first go on stage because they don't know what else to do. So sometimes you'll see a heavy impression of somebody and they don't really realize they're doing it, but that's their hero that they're doing an impression of. And hopefully their personality comes through sure, eventually yeah. and marries all these different things together. Because all we can do, ultimately all we can do as as art artists or musicians is have good taste and steal from the best. Yep. And then hopefully filter them together through the coffee filter of your mind and turn it into something. Uh, so what's, yeah. What's the phrase? Uh, good artists borrow, great artists steal. I, yeah, that is the phrase, yeah. But again, try to cover your tracks. <laughs> and don't rip off any melodies or harmony. Look, you've got tons of bits toys around here. I know, Let's I've see. got too much stuff here. you got, got the EVH Crybaby, is there anything? I actually never used one of those. Is I it... use that on this record exclusively because I was just trying to mix stuff up and it has a gigantic sweep on it. It's really to... long and uh, not terribly noticeable. So I like to use the wah occasionally, not constantly quacking through every note, right. but to use it almost like an oscillator or uh, in a very slow moving phaser sure. sometimes, which is sometimes what a phaser sounds like. Absolutely. I, yeah. uh, Hawkwind used to do it. Oh, yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. It yeah. was just slowly. Slow, slow, slow. Bit, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's sometimes. And then again, going back to Brian May, it would sound like to me, maybe on good company or something, that he mm. is getting a more nasally sound on on one guitar and then another one's pushed a little bit sure. more. So sometimes I would, That's what I, hear too, yeah. I would do a little bit of that, just yeah. cock the wall in a different mm -hmm. position and get a different sound and fan it out over, right. you know, the whole stereo spectrum if you can. Yep. And uh, create a little, and, and you know, Ulrich is very used to me layering guitars. He has a whole methodology that he uses before. He just goes, I know what to do with this. So he'll, he'll hear my songs and go, all right, this is your guitar symphony, I know what to do. And then he helps make sense of tons and tons of layers of things. So um, so yeah, that's that's something I've gotten excited about. This pedal here is something that I use as my lead channel. Um, this is the Andy Timmons, here I'll just unplug this because it's been in use. This is the Andy Timmons JHS pedal. Nice. And he has got just a great tone. And I mean, it's like a Marshall mm. JCM 800 in a box with a little bit extra gain and a really good, I mean, all you really want to do is be able to have your mid-range um, usable. And most of these different positions of your mid-range, you can find something that works. And you've got like a, almost like an attenuator where you can get 50 watts, 100 watts, and you can get rattier, a little spills around the edge a little bit, a little bit more compressed and tight distortion. Is that actually made by JHS? JHS made it, and it's the AT pedal. And I right. think there's a new uh, AT, Andy Timmons AT. Um, so. Nice. I believe that uh, there's a new version out or something like that, but he's uh, he's that company is really cool, and he uh, works well with people and gets dials it in until it's right. That's perfect. I have that. I have this. Here's another Eddie Van Halen pedal, which is the MXR 
EVH overdrive, and it's a distortion pedal. I wouldn't really call it an overdrive. I put mm -hmm. this in front of a clean Marshall, and that was my main rhythm sound on the, the most recent Galacticon 2. Wonderful. Yeah, so this one's very usable, and I pretty much oscillated between these two. Um, I used this Helix for a couple I was wondering things. if you were using that. Yeah, I, I did something. There's a song called... Uh, there's a song called To Kill a God, and... Um, and there's this whole breakdown section where I'm, I'm layering, again, layering guitars. Melodies are kind of coming in, coming out, and it's this long, slow breakdown. And I have, I wanted to get something close to a Pete Townsend kind of, a, you know, keyboard breakdown and won't get fooled again. Mm -hmm. And so I used the Helix with this crazy, buzzy, electronic sounding fuzz mm -hmm. and uh, with an octave pedal that's going up and down throughout that. So there's an octave in the middle that's traveling up and down. And then I used the Boss Slicer pedal, which is not out in front of me right here. And um, and I was just, every single note is traveling stereo from left to right ear. And nice. I wanted to hear a lot of just traveling left and right. Maybe it's because I'd, since my last record, I'd begun smoking pot. <laughs> and honestly, I swear to God, it changes how you mix a record completely. I can't believe, it. I mean, I like, things again it's the 70s I, they were messing around in the studios mm -hmm. and then people were like yeah just leave it where it is eh, left right and center whatever and then people started playing with that stuff so if you listen to this record on headphones you're going to hear a lot of really cool surprises you'll hear that little pick attack scratch with that six pence and you'll hear i completely oh, understand yeah i mean that's, yeah. How, that's how i listened to queen for the first time was yeah. on the headphones big old pair of sony's that were like this huge around my head i uh by the way it's medical marijuana so don't come at me um <laughs> But uh, but seriously, if you get high and listen to my record, you're gonna really enjoy it a right. lot. But uh, ear candy, yeah, that's that's part of the thing. I mean, I like I grew up on ELO and all that stuff too. And there's Me always too. something amazing going on. I have a vocoder over mm -hmm. there that finds its way in a few songs. So not only am I thinking about Queen, I'm trying to think of not... out of the blue. Yeah, oh. exactly, Mr. Blue Sky. Yeah, it's an amazing symphonic piece. Oh, and it turns into this crazy. Da, da. Oh, yeah. oh, the the outro, that crazy Lydian. Oh, my hair is standing yeah. on the I know, yeah. Remember that first time I heard that? I saw him recently, too. You did? How was that? It was it was so good, I was suspicious. Oh. Seeing Jeff Lynn at the Hollywood Bowl. Um, he was so good, I was suspicious that I had to go like talk to somebody. I was like, wait a minute, it sounded too good. And then someone said, well, I know someone in their band. I'm, I'm going to find out if they played a tracks. And I thought, yeah, find out. And they played with you know part of the L.A. Phil because mm -hmm. they have all the strings and everything and it really and it sounded so good and the background vocals were where i was where i started getting suspicious and i said no everything's they're they're that good and i thought well mm -hmm. he's got a he is a perfectionist so it would make yeah. sense so yeah so they sounded great i also know? think it, the, for me personally i think the what's so great about his production mm -hmm. is that you can tell he knows how to make the most out of it so when you listen to some of the songs, they're just one, four, five. So just G's, yeah. C's, and D's. Yeah. But there's so much beautiful sonic stuff going on that you don't feel you're restricted to three chords. Well, he also does, he does a couple surprises here and there, but he's one, four, five, one, six, two, five. Yeah. He does. Uh, you can tell he grew up on doo wop and yeah. and American, you know, um, Motown stuff. You can hear a lot of that inside of his. A lot, and he keeps reusing, and he will substitute a couple chords every once in a while for a little bit of a surprise. But um, but he dry, he just knows how to. You're right. He can milk sounds. He'll double his snares with hand claps and crazy things. And his guitar, his what does he play? Like the '54 Gold Top with P90s. That's mm -hmm. part of his sound too. Sure. Always sounds great. Doesn't sound like he's distorting it too much. And but it's compressed and it sings really well. Violin like. Mm -hmm. Melodies, even in Mr. Blue Sky, yep. sounds so good. His layering of acoustic guitars is unbelievable. Oh yeah, with like the Tom Petty stuff, yeah. just shoom, shoom, shoom. I got to, I got to take a look at his acoustic, hmm. and um, the the strings were very light mm -hmm. and very low action, right. and and I and I thought, okay, that's that sound. Right. Listen to Traveling Wilburys, you hear, listen to sure. all that stuff. That's part of his acoustic sound. And yes, layering, layering, layering. I got to work yeah. with Don Smith 
um, who'd made those Traveling Wilburys records. And oh, really? He said the, the, the classic 12-string sound is actually two guitars. It's the Nashville tuning, the high string, with that, just because then you get the perfection of, of the chords being fully you know, strummed or articulated. And that's, yeah, it also has to do with what you're picking with and how you're picking. Yep. It also, you have to kind of be Jeff Lynne to get that sound yep. too. Uh, but yeah, I mean, yeah, George told... Harrison too, all the George Harrison sure. records he did. Anyway, I'm a geek, if you haven't figured it out. I know Being I'm, no a geek's good, I'm okay. known for heavy metal, but this is where I came from. This stuff, yeah. Queen, you know, all British bands who were influenced by the Beatles. You yeah. know? And the Beatles were influenced by American bands. Exactly. So everyone's <laughs> like, the yeah. snake is eating the, its own tail in a fantastic way. Yeah. yeah. And then when punk rock came and New Wave came across in England, that again was all stolen from you guys because it was all the New York scene. All we wanted to be was uh, Ramones, television, you know, all these oh, yeah. Without New York doubt. dolls. Patty Smith. Without Iggy a doubt. Stooges. But they, but they no, also. Underground. They had songwriting chops too. They had cool cores and they ripped off from the Beatles too, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. My, my personal favorite period yeah. of music is the period we're talking about, yeah. which is mid late 70s to early 80s, about 83, yeah. 84. Yeah. I feel like everything came together because we still had, we're listening to the Beatles. Yeah. But like an album like The Game is one of my personal favorites. What's the genre on The Game? Is it Dragon oh, yeah. Attack? I or know. Or is it a Crazy Little Thing Called Love? Or is it Another One Bites the Dust? Sure. It, well, <laughs> on that one, because that's when they really started getting into dance stuff too. Yeah. But you're right. But there's still heavy rock, and then there's play rockabilly. The play the game is a crazy odyssey. Yeah. Uh, what is that? Save right? me. Yeah, save me is gospel. Yeah. Right. Yeah. No, no, no. That's that's it it's kind of is. classic, classic Classical. queen. It's I suppose yeah. It kind of goes back to to um, anybody yeah, find me somebody to love. It's got that same kind of save me kind of save me. Save me. Yeah. yeah 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 somebody to love is what i was thinking about. that's the yeah. more gospel yeah, one yeah that's the gospel one but yeah. yeah but yeah that one's crazy i think uh news of the world has got so many oh, different yeah. sounds where it does get punk and uh roomy guitar mics and yeah. all that stuff where you can just hear the the room yeah. and the refractions off the glass or whatever yeah. um that's got so many different sounds on that record every single song sounds like it's from a different record but you put them together and it all makes sense all makes perfect sense yeah and this and how they how they record each song sounds different sleeping yeah. on the sidewalk is an amazing song mm -hmm. which is like yeah. it sounds roy orbison too you can tell yeah. that these guys also loved and you can really tell with jeff lynn roy orbison is definitely there and with brian may when he sings to me mm -hmm. it's roy orbison he's got a great voice anyway yeah um yeah that is quite an era because i think they had they had restrictions to deal with, especially Queen. You think about Roy Thomas Baker and what they did to make Night at the Opera work, which was, you know, being creative, having restrictions. Right now, look at what I have here. I have a thousand guitars. I have a hundred pedals. I have hard drive space forever. I have plugins forever. So I have too many options, too many options. What they had were no options and they had to get really creative. So how do I get a cool sound? Put the headphones in a coffee can and put a mic in there mm -hmm. and you can get that really cool sound from good old fashioned lover sure. or whatever it is. Yeah. Or um, they use it somewhere on that. Yep. Or stretch the tape around, flange the whole song out for one moment, which is another queen thing that I rip off to. Phase, off, phase a whole section of the song, sure. the master of it or any of that stuff. But they got really creative with restrictions and i feel like that's that's a really important part of being creative um with metal eclipse with death clock my rules for myself were um well i'm going to tune my guitar low because that's what i hear people doing right now from all the modern metal so i'm going to go down to c and i was doing research and just going like okay how how low can i get this without it starting to feel like you know before it starts folding in on itself sure. and you just have a bunch of floppy strings with no tension whatsoever so i thought okay c standard going down a major third sounds really cool immediately when you play a guitar that's tuned down to c standard you're sounding heavier it sounds scarier yep. everything sounds a little bit more dramatic and i thought okay this is great and i'm not a good piano player so being in the key of C is very helpful for me. <laughs> yeah. So the lowest note on my guitar is C. <laughs> yeah. C, C on the white yeah. keys on the piano. Perfect. This is perfect. It's got to have double kicks. It's got to have some kind of some kind of ostentatious guitar work that's going to force me to have to like really hone some chops. Mm -hmm. And um, and then I've got no melody in the vocal, so the melody's got to come from the guitars. And that's where I go. Okay, heavy music, Brian May. There's Death Clock. There's Galacticon. There's all that stuff. So working with melodic restrictions kind of helped me 
try to think how how much can I squeeze out of no melody in the vocal. It's 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 like uh, it's basically I'm rapping in a heavy voice. <laughs> it's true. I think about it when I, I've done so many songs. Well, for Death Clock, maybe, yeah, but yeah. not so much for Galacticon. Not Galactic right? Galacticons, yeah. where I'm like pitch, oh my gosh, matching pitch, matching, giving myself guide tracks. Sure. I practice guitar all the time. I don't practice vocals all the time. Yeah. So it's treachery for yeah. me to get that stuff up and running. I was just talking about that on a production uh, uh, video we did recently. It's like, I do that all the time. Either myself or a singer, I'll play the melody out. I mean, it helps. It truly does. If yeah. you're stacking, I remember I did this back on my first TV show, Home Movies, which was very lo-fi, and I had harmonies that were three-part voice-led harmonies that I would just work on on an acoustic guitar, and then I would just sit there and just, I'd record them, and, but it's, you know, voice-led, you know, which is like, you're moving, voice-led, for those of you who don't know, is you take a triad and you, you have three or four other chords you're trying to move to, is the question is, how little can I move these notes to reharmonize, you know, to get from one chord sure. to the next, like one a to the four chord. player. Exactly. You. Or it's it's also classical mm -hmm. or baroque or you know sure. traditional harmony, which is stuff I learned at Berklee College of Music. Oh, you went to Berkeley. So yeah. I went to Berkeley. Yeah. So I did have a traditional harmony class, and honestly, that opened up. I couldn't believe how cool a one four five sounded. You know. Yeah. But I'll even play it on acoustic here. I'll show you here. I don't know if this will pick up enough. But, it will. Um. But here is a uh, just. So even if I'm going one, five, oh wait, one, four, five, one. We know these chords are, whoa, geez. I don't know what happened. Oh, my pick's in there. <laughs> I've done so, that. This is a good example of bad guitar playing. <laughs> one, four, five, one. And then just to take it here. Yep. That just sounds way more interesting. Yeah. Yeah, you. But, but that's how I harmonize all the th all my vocals too. I just think about, and that's 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 where it starts getting more interesting too. So, yeah. but the most exciting part is the note that doesn't move. Sure. And to me, when I'm harmonizing guitars or harmonizing vocals or piano parts, whatever it is. That's way more interesting. The note that doesn't move ends up being the most powerful note. If you vibrato that like crazy, then it starts sounding like Brian May. <laughs> I the, the weirdest thing is um, yeah. because Brian such a and Queen is such a huge uh, influence on me. They're one of the few the band that I've spent less time figuring out. Oh, that's you know I'm what? a little kind of like that's there's a danger to being on the inside of. But they switch stuff up so often and make stuff, and they've reinvented themselves from record to record. You know, when you go through their whole um, their whole library, you know, once they get into uh, what hot space, it just breaks all the rules of sure. earlier Queen records. Then you get to the Miracle, and that breaks all the rules. And you get to Innuendo, and that breaks all the rules. You can still hear the stuff, but they're definitely changing and evolving. From you know, you go back to the first Queen record, Keep Yourself Alive, and mm -hmm all that stuff, they're the same people who are open to new ideas. And that's that's fun. I mean, they're, and then you want their bands like ACDC. You don't want them to change. Sure. I need I need power <laughs> chords, and I need a steady drum beat, and I need Bon Scott or whatever just singing over it. And... Eighth note bass line going dong, dong, dong. Yes, dong, dong, dong. and yeah. it's the most powerful thing in the world. Oh, yeah. Best driving music ever. Without a doubt. Without yeah. a doubt. I mean, I think like... You know, when people ask me the heaviest songs on earth, I think, yeah, there are really heavy, brutal songs, Cannibal Corpse and um, Dimu Borger and, uh, you know, thrashy, cool song, Exodus from, you know, now in the 80s and the 90s, all that stuff, Anthrax, they're so heavy. But the most badass songs to me are always the, the slow, medium tempo driving. There's nothing more powerful than the, than the Prophet song. Mm -hmm. When he starts doing that one, uh, that uh, five of climb the bound, which is chromatic, but he's using the third of every fi uh, mm -hmm. five of the next chord to lead up. To, anyway, yep. it's the most powerful thing in the world. Then, and then ACDC's For Those About to Rock sure. is one of the most powerful songs I've ever heard in my life. Or Sign of the Southern Cross, Dio era Black Sabbath is a gorgeous ballad that becomes so heavy and powerful. Sure. Just so much uh, strength inside I of. I the first time I heard Neon Knights. Oh that, yeah, that yeah. Guitar riff. Yeah, 
That's awesome stuff too. Amazing. Amazing. Yeah. Anyway, um, I don't even know where I'm going anymore. I'm just no, talking no, it's about good. music. To yeah. me, like the first Black Sabbath record, still one of my biggest inspirations because I remember being like 11, going to a friend's house. And them giving me the album cover and mm-hmm. saying like, "Is that a witch? What is that?" Yeah. Looking through the floor. And what then is dong, it? dong, the church bells ringing and your hairs are all standing on end. That <laughs> record is so great. The Wizard to me is one of the ultimate metal rock songs of all time. That's on that record, right? I believe so. Yeah, I'll be but corrected. It starts out. It starts out with a harmonica, <laughs> and it's yeah. the harmonica. You're going, "What is a harmonica doing yeah. in my heavy metal song?" And it totally makes sense. But I think it's a. Uh, um, Bill Ward's drums are so it's just it just sounds like the equipment of the era and maybe I'm nostalgic but I don't think so I think it just lands on my ears really well that the pitch of his snare the pitch of his drums the fact that the guitars are really saturated and they sound crystal clear everything's Mm -hmm. everything sounds like you know whatever it was they were a bunch of poor guys who were working jobs all day and, you know... T- Only he had lost his fingertips lost in his the finger to, that's how the hard day before yeah, exactly. his last day or whatever, yeah. He, yeah. And then he, he put banjo strings on his guitar so he yeah. could still play them because the, there was like only one gauge of string back then. Yeah. And um, whatever it and was... La- and Laney, the owner of Laney, was his childhood friend. Who was oh, build, was that what it was? Building the amps. And he was building the amps. So it's, it's like, yeah, pretty awesome. Whatever it took to get those guys in that studio with whatever equipment was there. Two days, recorded two day, Exactly, two days. Mm-hmm. And there's you can't change anything about that. It's so perfect the way that We were just talking, young Liam sitting behind the camera about yeah. the struggle. Yeah. I mean, you've got Brian May and his dad building their first I guitar. I know, I know. It's just, it's the same struggle. It's like you... But, but interest. I mean, so many people p- play a guitar and they go, all right, here, I know how to tune it. That's it. But Brian May is a different beast because he wanted to know why a guitar, why, how does this work? Why copper and magnets? Why, how can you, uh, yeah, not only that, I'd like the option to to reverse the phase on my guitar, Mm -hmm. which is part of his sound as well too, when he gets those chimey, clean, nasally sounds. And a very low output pickup, it's a bird's pickup. Yeah, Yeah. and those, there's a lot to be said for low output pickups that, that, yeah. Anyway, so yeah. yeah, it's it's a it's a crazy time. We have too many options right now, which is not, which makes creative people lose their minds. And then some stuff's too easy too. Yeah, <laughs> there's a reason get, there are less guitars because there are other instruments that are easier to play. Yeah, with MIDI and all that stuff. But a guitar, uh, uh, you know, it's definitely teaches how do you everything. You, yeah. With that in mind, then how do you? Because I wonder. Because I'm the worst producer of myself. Oh yeah. How do you stop yourself from... My problem is, is I'll pl- if you played guitar on a mm. song for me, I say I sent you a track and you mm. played on it. If you were behind or on top, I'd be like, wow, I love his feel. It's amazing. Right, if I do it, right, I'm right, on right. top or behind. I'm out yeah, of time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I feel that way about my own stuff. Where I hear it and I go, I've committed to something and we're in the mixing stage and I cannot get over the fact that I'm late on these things or I'm early here. I, I lose my... Look... At some point, that this the whole piece is working, and the little tiny things you can let go. It's like filming too, where if you've established characters and logic, hopefully, they'll <laughs> they'll excuse me the fact that there's a boom mic back in the shot, or there's a reflection of the camera in the window, sure. or some little tiny thing. Some of my favorite movies have mistakes in them. Some of my favorite songs have what the guitar players Richie Blackmore more hated everything he did in the studio. Where mm-hmm. I think he's amazing. I sure. mean. He he considered himself to have red light disease. He was scared. He's just like, I'm more of a live guitar player. The red light screws me up. Um, we're supposed to hate our own stuff. Mm-hmm. I think that's supposed to be our... our okay. uh, I think that's supposed to be my... I can't be in love with my stuff. I have to do it to a point where I think, you know, and then release it. But my problem is not necessarily your problem because what? You probably won't let something out because you just don't think it's good enough because you... Right. So that's that's a problem that we all have. Well, it's because I, I, I record people full time. Right. So I have those kind of filters and I, can't, I just can't apply the same thing to myself. It's if I was nice an artist have... primarily, maybe I could, but I can't. Yeah. Uh, well, <laughs> that's that, but that's a burden that we all have to get, sure. get over it. And, and, and then, you know, part of this whole thing is 
you know, at some point we've got to say goodbye to it and let other people make up their minds about it, mm -hmm. you know, and they're the critics or they're the fans or they're the, the haters or whatever it is. That's their job. My relationship with it will be totally different and will never be the audience's relationship with it. Um, what I hear and what excites me may not, uh, in a song that I do, may not be what the audience hears. And then every once in a while, someone will, someone will go, oh, that's my favorite part. And I go, you're the one person who said that, and that's my favorite part of a piece. Um, my problem is I over, this, it, it's part of my process. I know what my process is. And, uh, and I remember as I was doing this most recent record, the Galacticon 2, I thought, I'm writing lots of demos. Ooh, this song's cool. This one, forget about it. That one is good, and I can fix that other part. This one's cool. So I, I get to a point where I'm, I feel positively about even my demos. Um, I demo all my guitars. I program all the drums. I get in the studio with the drums. I do all my rhythm guitars. And then I bring everything back here. So I, I work with Ulrich for a long stretch with drums and rhythm guitars because I don't want to do heavy metal rhythm guitars alone because it's... Uh, it's a misery I wouldn't wish upon anybody because it's it's just about there's no fun in it. It's administrative work to me because I've already <laughs> written the riff. I've already decided how I'm going to play it. And I don't I'm not good at playing it yet because I just came up with it or I haven't really gotten it under my fingers for more than to make it, you know, get it knocking in rhythm enough for a demo. And now I really have to learn it and kind of figure it out and then. And then I have to do, not only do I have to play it perfectly, I have to play it perfectly twice and have it match and lock in for the left and right side. And some people do down the middle also, like three of the exact same track. I know some bands do, Metallica has. I know Steve Vai will sometimes triple track stuff. Um, anyway, other people do it. <laughs> it's, it's the less, because again, this is not, this is tedious, administrative, this is not creative. And... And I just focus on how shitty my guitar playing is, yeah. you know, which is a uh, which is good. I mean, I'm supposed to go through that, and I realize that that's where I'm at. I'm at the part where I'm supposed to hate my guitar playing. Then I take all that stuff, and I listen to the drums and the bass and the guitars, and I go, okay, now I'm gonna I'm gonna finish the songs. I may even I reserve the right to rip open a song and rearrange it here, you right. know. Right. Um, if I'm hearing something, if I'm hearing like this part, I'm losing interest. I'm losing interest in. in in my own song here, what can I do? What is this? Why is that? And I'll listen to my own songs over and over and over again to try to find out what is the emotional crux, what is the, uh, where am I building? What am I subverting your expectation? How do? How am I the audience right now? How am I? How am I experiencing it? Sure. Um, and and then there are parts that I'll go this part. I, I have to try this. So I'm going to save a version. I'm going to shuffle through this and just get rid of this thing and smash it all together. And then I go, that works. That doesn't work. Or, you know, and, and then that's where I'm at the point where I hate everything. And then once I really start doing vocals and vocal passes and melody tries or whatever, or just finding the melody, most of the time I don't know what it is. I just know what the harmony is and the harmony indicates everything for me. Sure. You know, um, and that's where I really start hating what I'm doing. And then I go, wow, I just spent, you know, eight hours today doing stuff that I hate. And then I go, oh, right, right. That's where I'm at in the process. And then I'm going to start liking it again. I remember ah. that because I've done it. <laughs> I've done, this is my sixth record, my sixth studio record at this point, you know, within a decade. So it's a lot of time doing this stuff. So process is really important. Coming to know certain parts of the process in the writing, in the uh, overdubbing, in the finishing of the song. I know, and then I get an emotional excitement when it starts working, mm -hmm. when the whole thing finally starts coming together and the mixing starts happening. Because I, so then I go to the mixing stage where I go, all right, all right, I'm looking for this record. I'm looking for a little bit more of this, a little bit less of that, a little bit more of this. And let's really zero in on, you know, something, you know, I'll give them some kind of an idea. Um, but, uh, the first mix is always torture as well. So quick question. I see Friedman's and I see Marshall's. Yes. I must ask you, because I've never had a direct comparison between them. Oh, yeah. Because um, This is the only Friedman I have. This is a, I believe, a 40 watt. Um, it's called the Dirty Shirley. And it's a really simple amp. And to me, I can get, um, it's not super gainy, but it really works well with gain pedals. So and it's got an effects loop. So if I want to just do a, you know, a gig out here, 
um, I like to use this. To me, it kind of feels like if I want to do an evening of the Who, this would be a perfect amp right. for me. I can get it dirty enough, um, and then I can put pedals in front of it. And I can again, I like an effects loop and an amplifier. Um, I like putting delay and reverbs behind, and then putting everything else in front. Um, and then for the Marshall, for the Marshall, this is the Satriani Marshall. Um, obviously, I'm a Satriani fan, and um, I uh, I like the gain on this, but I use the clean channel for that and put pedals in front of it. This is the Kerry King amp over here, which is a um, it's a, it's like a modded JCM 800. It has like an extra gain stage, but it's a really interesting and an unexpected EQ curve because that's the Slayer amp. You'd expect it to be uh, scooped like that, mm -hmm. but it's actually more of a frown curve EQ. It's very easy on the ear, and I really like it. Um, and I toured with that amp a lot, and it mm -hmm. just was rock solid the whole time. I, I In my mind, I would have liked to have, uh, it's got a noise gate built into it too, which is always helpful in heavy metal because you're doing all these stops and starts and mm -hmm. you know trying to clasp your strings, and I'm always pitching my volume pedal back and making sure that sure. you know everything's, uh, it squashes all the sound, but that has a really good one. It, the one thing it doesn't have is an effects loop, and if you haven't, if you're using your sound gate, noise gate, and you're using delays or reverbs, it squashes those too simp too early, ah, you know. So if I have dun dun, you know, bonk yeah. bonk bonk, it just stops the delay. Ah, I see. Squashes that, and then I have an Ingve Malmsteen Marshall right there too. So I'm a big fan of Marshall. Me uh, too. So is that yeah. that's basically a super lead, yeah? Yeah, it is. Foot. It also has an a added gain stage. So it's got this really warm uh, violin-like kind of gain inside of it that's really exciting. And nice. I use that on, I use it in a few different places on the Death Album 3, which is, uh, there's a song, there are a couple really just warm little melodic kind of flute-like sounds that I think Ingve gets out mm -hmm. of his strats and stuff. But I think I use Gibson's inside of that. And I, there is a song called Impeach God. <laughs> <laughs> there's, a, there's a God reference of the. Uh, there are two. There are two in this particular instance. Yeah, there's this one. There are two very, two very questionable references about killing God and impeaching God. Um, but uh, they're God metaphor a metaphor for somebody else. There are metaphors for. Uh, ah. I think it's a political statement. Uh, right. If you want to read the lyrics, you'll see what I'm talking about. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but uh, but yeah, it's. Um, but I use that on that song, and I use that uh, on. Uh, a couple other places, but it's really warm and very pretty, and Eric Johnson-y at times too, you know. Sure. Um, so I really like that too. And then I've got, um, I've got, a, there's a 50 watt. Oh, there's more heads under there here. There are yeah. two, a couple different 50 watt amps, Marshalls. I have a um, 1987 XL uh, 50 watt that I had modded hmm. um, by Johnny Meyer, who was the guitar tech at the time, who did a really great mod, and it just has this really great sparkly Van Halen-y kind of warmth to it and it's just it's really cool and i use that all over the first galacticon and it's really funny because i think all because i'm an idiot when it comes to this stuff i have people help me set this up i'm not good at any of this i set it and i leave it so i have mics on my my marshall cabinet on the inside of that room and they don't get touched i like where they are they're good what <laughs> um, mics are they I have a you know I have a fifty seven and a four twenty one and I have a Royer which I don't use as much. I use, usually blend the fifty seven and the four twenty. Is four twenty one? Is that what it, yeah. yeah. And I asked around. I went I went to Steve Vice Studio and I said, let me just take pictures of your signal path. Do you mind? Sure. And so it's his legacy carbon amplifier with the four twenty one and fifty seven, and I follow those into an API or a uh, the BAE. Um, 1073s? Yeah, yeah. Is that 1073? Yeah. Uh, and you can see it says Royer in 57, and I have a 421 up there. Great. But then I blend them all, and I just commit to it. Perfect. And um, there's a little blender thing. That's actually Ulrich's as well. He's not getting... The kidding. little Mackie or Behringer. He's or not getting... Yeah. yeah, it's a little Behringer thing. And Behringer? He is, uh, yeah. I think it is. I yeah. think it is. I don't know. It could be Mac. But, um, but it's his, and he's never going to get it back. Yep. But he has my things too. In fact, all this stuff, like all this stuff, is stuff that I loaned him for other recordings, and I think I loaned him this as well recently. But yeah, I like to set stuff up. So I think so. So basically, what I'm saying is, I had this 1987 XL 50 watt modded Marshall that sounded really great, and I really liked the sound I got from it. And I was talking to Ulrich about something. I was like, "Hey, can you help me figure out a couple things? Maybe make sure my mics are out of phase." And he says, "Hey, uh, dude, you're um, you're uh, your amp cable is 
is an instrument cable. <laughs> and I said, no shit, <laughs> really? Not, not a speaker cable, right? Yeah. Uh, he says, it's not a speaker cable. And <laughs> what it was doing, it was really interesting because the sound I was getting was this really nice buffered sound. And it did this buffered thing that I really, really got used to. And I, I didn't, I don't know if I was destroying something on either side. I could probably, very, but, probably, <laughs> but that destruction. But in the meantime, <laughs> yeah, in the meantime, it was sounding really good. Yeah. And I was, um, I think I was, I was going through a lot of, uh, what was it capacitor? What is the, um, the little thing? These. I was going through these. I don't know why I can't think. Uh, oh right. They're you, little. You're uh, blowing fuses. I was blowing fuses constantly. Yeah. And do you think that's why? I'm sure it was. Or I'm sure it was a contributing factor. Yeah. Well. Answers on a postcard, please. Yes. <laughs> I don't know. Either way, I got a really cool sound on that record, and uh, you know, you just kind of want to change things up from record to record. But I should have just committed to that guitar sound because it was. It's a really good sound that I got. It was probably my favorite guitar sound that I've gotten, and I just wanted it to be that records, the first Galacticon records. So there's a lot of cool sounding guitars on that record. Um, so there you go. So I have 50 watt things. I have a, I have right. a JCM 850 watt also, which Fantastic. is really nice. Yeah, I got, and I got more amps where that came from. I got too much stuff, too many options. Can you have too much stuff as a guitar player? Um, well, when, it's, when, it's, when it, it starts to narrow your workspace, it may, <laughs> no, you're right though. There's no such thing as too uh, yeah. many guitars. Look, no. having a guitar or restringing a guitar or just, having something that feels new inspires us to be creative and that's do you remember those days when you had the one guitar yeah and you used to take the strings off and you'd clean all the frets oh and... yeah i do i have that guitar down here i do somewhere maybe oh yeah it's right next to you this it's is that my strat? it's it's this yeah this one right here i'll show you whoops that's what I thought, I thought it might be when i walked in yeah so this one is my guitar that i got before i went to college so i was 19 years old and i hardtail yeah, hardtail. I didn't want to. Yeah. I didn't. I had like gone past the whammy bar thing, and I did not want to string a guitar again with the whammy bar. <laughs> and uh, and it's this is Warmoth parts. Oh right, so, yeah. great company. Yeah, and I had for a long time. I had Tom Anderson pickups in here. So this is just like a versatile, ev do everything guitar, and um, it plays really great. I love this kind of somewhere in between neck. It's not too fat, not too thin, but mostly he fatter. You know, if you feel it. Also unfinished. Oh, nice. Could be a little out of tune, but but uh, kind of nasally, kind of a little honky, you know. And then I have some Seymour Duncan's in there, which are really fun. It's great. I love it. Yeah, it's a cool guitar. Yeah, and just that sort of like uh, ritual of taking it off. I do, oh, I used to clean all the finger yeah. gunk you'd get in there. So that would do. Then there's it's all over there too, and I'll clean this every once in a while too. But um, then that... you restring it, and then you then then you, your fingers would get all that black, those black lines on it from the brand new strings. Yeah. Geeky question: What strings do you use? I use um, I use uh, Dunlop strings. So I have tons of Dunlop strings. Oh so yeah, they, I noticed. The... They uh, these are the ones that I would use for heavy stuff. So this is there. These are like. These are the custom set for Death Clock. So this would be like my normal heavy string guitar. Wow, string. 13 so to 56. 13 to 56. Man but, strings. Yeah, but I'm tuned down a major third, so oh, it kind of feels like tension, like normal normal tension of like tens, what, which is what those are. These so, normal tens? Those are tens on that, so those could be... So they, um, they have a heavy core inside too, which is just, it just feels like I'm playing a regular, regular guitar that's and then the, the, the problem with all the heavy guitar stuff is that my G is wound. So right. there's just like an extra push or pull you have to do right. to get that wound. So when I go from when I go from like playing a guitar that is heavy tuned and heavy strung to a regular guitar, I will overbend like crazy sure. on these guitars. But it really really uh makes Are you work. Are you still for using this this baby? From I love time that to guitar. Time? I, I um that guitar I don't know if it's my best sounding guitar, but it is one of my favorite guitars that I have, just uh, maybe for sentimental purposes. Oh, no, the neck feels beautiful. But my f best sounding guitars are all from the custom shop, the Gibson custom shop. So my Les Pauls, my my reissues, so that gold top uh, 57 reissue is outstanding sounding. Um, this is, it's beautiful looking. And I have an SG over there that's just a uh, Gibson USA black SG that is just has magic sounds to it. Grab it, young Liam. Yeah, so this one, uh, so I use this guitar, which is just like a, a very recent um, 
Gibson USA uh, SG, standard. And I use this for the rhythm guitar on the song Rebuilding a Planet, which is an instrumental song at the end of the, the record. But uh, it plays fantastically. It sounds really great. All these guitars have old strings. But uh, yeah, and then I'll use, this is a Galacticon pick. I'll have to get one of those. Yeah, you can have this one. Thank you ever but so much. You'll see it's, uh, it is um, an Altex, so it's Dunlop. Altex, which is like a very dense plastic. Oh, wow. And you can really hear that attack. And that's a 1.14, which is a pretty heavy pick. But you can hear the attack. Here, you can try it on this one. I see you're looking around for some. Okay. But uh, you Oh, yeah. And it's got a pointed tip, too. So it just oh, I like can that. move less. I think I can get to strings a little bit. Uh, but yeah, I used to play the Jazz 3s. And I did too, the Dunlops with the... Uh, yeah. yeah, like the Eric Johnson on the shreddy kind of like pointy things. And I couldn't play another pick. I couldn't play a Fender Medium just because I was so used to the, just the tiny movements that I made with that thing. And then they sent me those picks, the Altex ones, and um, it totally changed how I... It, it just it's great. It's, it's a great pick. Those little tiny things, you know, as a yeah. musician, you're working in millimeters, millimeters from how yeah. you hold your pick, which, what angle. Yeah. where your finger is, with what the well, scale recent, of your guitar is. That's that recent stuff. for me. I, I used to, because you know, I grew up wanting to be Holdsworth, so it was all yeah, it was all yeah. legato stuff. So in the last, and then when I started to get into like really good right hand picking, it was all mm. Aldi Miola, which is more, sure. which is more flat picking. It is, yeah. And I, I do both. We're all kind of like, especially ah. in metal, you want a little extra kind of attack. You can get a little extra scratch because right. most of heavy metal is playing lead guitar right around first position, you know, right on the low strings. Right. You know what I mean? Because you're going da 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 So you're just doing straight eighths or whatever down there and you're just trying to get a little bit of attack in there too. This is beautiful. That's a nice guitar. That one's a real... It's got some great sustain for an SG. They usually die off for me. Oh no, that one's... That one's great. I have some SGs. Every guitar is different. It doesn't matter if you, if they're all from the same tree. Every guitar is going to somehow match up differently. And that one just is a magical one. You see, uh, being such a huge Tony Iommi fan, I should be a fan of SGs. Yeah. Uh, you know. but, they're uh, great. The gold top looks gorgeous there. Absolutely yeah. fantastic. They're all great. Well, thank you ever so much. Yeah, it's fun talking to you. Yeah, this Absolutely. has been a blast. Good, good. Fun we talking about all that stuff, yeah. There's going to be loads of links flying around. There'll be links to the songs that we're talking about. Right. So check we'll, out uh, the check out the whole world of Galacticon. You can go to Galacticon. grab the new album cover. Let's do yeah. some shelf lists because anybody gets to the end of this 45 minute yeah. interview. Um, this is the record. Marvelous. And you'll see that there's a there's a whole world of stuff that you can see. There's a comic book that's being referenced to here. There's a Galacticon comic book that we just finished. Fantastic. Um, that you can get at Galacticon.com. There is the Galacticon Nightmare short film that you should check out if you like this stuff too. We'll have that in the blog. Again. Yeah. You'll be and, able to go uh, and see that. Check it all out. Marvelous. Yeah. Thank you very much, Brian. I really appreciate it. All right. Absolutely. Have a marvelous time recording and mixing. Please leave a bunch of comments and questions below. And if there's some good ones, I might ask Brendan to answer them. Got the thumbs up. That threw him under the bus. That's, yeah, now I'm in the position where I have to answer your questions. <laughs> <laughs>